Well, hello class. We're going to continue now our discussion of waves. And in our first video lesson, we talked about the fundamentals of waves. We, we said that there are two basic types of waves, a longitudinal or compression wave and a transverse wave, or one that sort of oscillates up and down. And that waves are a means by which energy travels through a medium, solid, liquid, or gas, and that one particular type of radiation, electromagnetic radiation, including light, can actually travel through a vacuum. We'll get to that in one of our later video lessons. We talked about the waveform for a wave, a sinusoidal waveform, and how that waveform was characterized by a peak-to-peak -peak wavelength, a frequency, which is the number of cycles or the number of peaks per second, a period, which is the time between the peaks on the time axis, and a linear velocity. We said, for example, that sound traveling through air has a linear velocity of 340 meters per second, whereas light traveling through a vacuum has a linear velocity much faster, a million times faster approximately, of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that's a quick review of our first video lesson. In this video lesson, we're going to talk about how waves can also travel through solids. Now, we know that waves, sound waves, can travel through air. We're fairly familiar with seeing waves in a body of water. But we're probably less familiar with the notion that sound can travel through solids. Actually, sound travels more rapidly through solids than it does through air. That might be surprising. Again, the linear velocity of sound, the compression wave of sound, traveling through air is 340 meters per second. Sound, or a compression wave traveling through water, is about four times as fast. And a compression wave traveling through steel, a solid like steel, travels as much as 18 times as fast as a compression wave traveling through air. So, in fact, sound or compression waves can travel more rapidly through solids and liquids, but through solids than through air. To give you an example, in the last lesson, we said that for sound to travel a mile in air takes five seconds. If you had a steel rail, like a railroad track, a steel rail, and you pinged it with a hammer, it would take five seconds for that sound, for you to audibly hear the sound a mile away, but it would take only about a quarter of a second for that compression wave to travel through the steel rail. So sound or compression waves can travel much more rapidly through solids. Now the reasons for bringing this up is because it has relevance to earthquakes. We will cover earthquakes in a completely different chapter in the second semester of this course where we talk about geosciences. But since we're talking about waves now, let's talk about some of the fundamentals. There are two important types of earthquake waves or seismic waves. One is called a P wave, which is a compression or longitudinal wave, one that's more like an accordion where the compression and the dilations are what is moving. And the other being an S wave, which is a transverse wave, more like the waves on the surface of, of a body of water, having a clear sinusoidal appearance. So the S, so P waves and S waves stand for primary waves and secondary waves. Now, as with compression waves traveling through metals like steel, the P wave travels with a very large velocity of about five to eight thousand meters per second. That's about three to five miles per second, much faster than the velocity of, of sound in air or the compression waves in air. The S wave moves with a linear velocity that is about one half of that of a P wave. And we will see in our chapter on geosciences that measuring the time of arrival of P waves and S waves gives geoscientists information about how far away an earthquake is from a particular location. 
This slide shows a simulation of a P wave, again, which is more like the accordion, where you have regions of compression and dilation which are moving. And if you focus on the black and square in the middle, you'll see that it moves back and forth, but then it comes back to a more or less the same place where it started. So that what is moving is actually this compression wave. Now a consequence is that all materials through which the P wave is traveling are not equally flexible. And that's why earthquakes can cause damage because the material through which the P wave is traveling does not have as enough give to absorb these compression waves. Now the S wave again, or the transverse wave, is one that's more like a sinusoidal wave. Again, if you focus on the black square in the middle, you'll see that it essentially is bobbing up and down. It comes back to more or less the same place it started as the energy is transmitted from the starting point or the left on, on this slide to the right. Of course, this can be a cause of significant damage to building materials and roads as well, as shown by this slide, where you can actually see the sigmoidal pattern due to this S wave. Now, there are other types of waves, too, besides the P, primary wave, and S, or secondary wave. And I'll give you one other example. It's called the love wave, which is, has more of a zigzag pattern. And if you uh, look at the black square again, you can see that it's sort of shifting back and forth uh, as a result of uh, this, the propagation of this uh, seismic wave. And the next slide shows an interesting consequence that can result from the traveling love wave. So again, the P wave and the S wave are the primary and secondary seismic waves that follow an earthquake, and that can be measured at any distance from an earthquake. And later we will talk about how these waves are used to triangulate and pinpoint the location of an earthquake site. But one other important aspect is that the P waves, the primary waves, the longitudinal compression waves, can travel both through solids and through liquids, whereas the S wave, as a result of an earthquake, can only travel through solids. Now, a result of this is that P waves can be transmitted through the core of the Earth, whereas S waves do not, and this provides some evidence that a part of the Earth's core especially what is called the outer core, is actually liquid. Again, next semester when we have a chapter devoted just to geosciences, we'll come back and talk about the structure of the Earth and the fact that the outer core is actually molten or liquefied. Okay, we'll pause again and have a, a brief quiz. And in the next video lesson, we'll talk about sound and music. I think I hear something.